Listener discretion is advised. They're making Usually fun not. of me because I have a Rudolph red nose. A little sweet nose. <laughs> All right. Uh, I had never heard of this individual, and she is fucking amazing and, like, lived her life. Mm-hmm. Perfect. I've like, got one of those gals, too. So this is going to be a strong lady parts episode. Fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. A lot of... um. Names and places and lovers. Mm. Oh, yeah. And we're just going to fucking get to it. So, also lots of Polish names. And so I'm just going to do my best and find a fucking American close enough equivalent. to Lots of Zs. Lots of Zs. Zs that sound like ch. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to do my best. So. (laughs) Christina Skarbek was born on May 1st, 1908 in Warsaw, Poland. Love. She was the daughter of Polish aristocracy. Her father, Count Jersey Skarbek. Okay. Uh, man, it's like Jersey aristocracy. There are counts. <laughs> Count Jersey Mike's. <laughs> Count Jersey Mike's subs, yeah. Skarbek. Hi. <laughs> Was a Roman Catholic, uh, but her mother, Stefania, whose maiden name was Goldfeder, was from a wealthy Jewish banking family. So this is a pretty common thing, Mm -hmm. especially at this time period, to have, like, one person from, like, a titled noble family and then one person from a non-aristocratic family but with money that can Mm -hmm. shore up the the aristocratic family Mm -hmm. because they need the money. Mm Mm-hmm. So, uh, according to some sources, Count Scarbeck was not very good with his money and had mm. a lot of, like, properties and debts that he had to fucking manage. And so he used his wife's dowry to pay down the debts that he owed when they got married and then continue this lavish lifestyle that he was used to but he couldn't actually afford. Great. Yeah. Classic. So... Young Christina was extremely close to her father, despite his money issues. She loved Jersey Mike's. (laughs) Um, Same. (laughs) She also shared his love for riding horses and skiing. So, again, lavish lifestyle. And she got easily bored staying home. So she usually just tagged along with him, like, wherever he went. Like, he Mm -hmm. would go on, like, business meetings and trips and whatever and into town and whatever. And she was just, like, a total daddy's girl hanging out with dad all the time. Mm -hmm. When Christina was 10, she met a boy named Andre Kowarski uh, at her family's horse stables. And this is because... Uh, his dad and her dad were having a business meeting, and so the dads brought their kids along so the kids could, like, play with the horses in the stables and they could, mm-hmm. like, discuss business. Right. So Exactly how I was raised. A thousand pers- uh, as one it's does. It's all, you just, you join daddy at the stables for business. Oh, daddy. daddy. Take me to Jersey Mike's. <laughs> I was brought along by my single mom to her bookkeeping gigs. <laughs> At the same. <laughs> so it's the same. It's the same. <laughs> like, I don't know. Play with this pen. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> play with that horse. Don't get yeah. kicked. I don't know. I'm busy. Uh, so Kowarski, the, the, that little boy that she was just playing with that day, would surface again years later and play a very significant role in her life. So you just okay. never know how fate it's going to work out. You really don't know. Um, so the 1920s were a tough decade for the family. They fell on difficult financial times and they had to give up their country estate. No. Not the ponies. And, oh. and move full time to Warsaw. Oh, a travel <laughs> uh, But then in 1930, Christina's beloved father died of tuberculosis. So that was a very tough blow for her. Mm-hmm. And by this point, um, her mom's family's banking empire had almost entirely collapsed, probably in part due to rising Mm anti-Semitism in Poland. Um, So this left her mom, a new widow, uh, you know, without a lot to fall back on trying to raise her daughter. 
So when Christina was 22, she didn't want to be a burden on her mom or on her mom's family. So she found a job. She was going to be a young working gal. And she started working at a Fiat car dealership. Love that for her. Mm-hmm. Um, she's also like stunningly beautiful, of course, mm. and we will get to it. Um, but she hadn't been at the job long before she started suffering from chest pain and coughing due to the fumes. Oh no! Oh. <coughs> and because her- oh god, it's oh, happening god. to me! Oh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> I've got the black lung pop. The black lung. <laughs> Um, so when she visited the doctor, they noted shadows on her chest x-rays that they feared could also be tuberculosis, and her father had died of tuberculosis, so they were taking it super, super seriously. Yeah. Um, so she was able to get some financial compensation from the Fiat dealership and their insurance company, and so she was able to take her doctor's advice, which was to get as much fresh air as possible, which we Mm -hmm. learned from the Waverly Hills Center. Sanatorium. Yep. She needed time in a solarium. She needed chef air. (laughs) So (laughs) she began. uh, I love how, like, you could just get a doctor's note. Yeah, to to get be outside more. And then insurance just covered it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The good old days. She literally, like, after working at this car dealership for, like, not very long, was just, like, given medical leave and Mm -hmm. went to the mountains and began spending most of her time uh, in the Tatra Mountains hiking and skiing. Good. (laughs) Get that (laughs) recovery, girl. Covered it. Yeah. Healthcare. Healthcare. That's what what the Stanley Hotel used to be Mm -hmm. for rich people with tuberculosis. Yeah. Just go chill and get chef air. She also entered the Miss Poland beauty pageant around this time and was awarded runner-up. Wow. Oh, wow. Just casually. Casually Miss Poland mm-hmm. runner-up. Miss Poland with TV. hmm So on April 21st, 1930, Christina married a businessman named uh, Gustav Getlick. Get it? Getlick. <laughs> Getlick. Getlick. <laughs> <laughs> but the marriage was short-lived. The couple soon realized that they were incompatible and parted ways amicably. Been there. But don't, but don't worry, <laughs> she soon fell in love again. You've also been there. Mm-hmm. But this time marriage was off the table because the new man's family forbade him from marrying a, quote, penniless divorcee. Uh, oh, yeah, been there too. <laughs> mm, I get That's it. That's why Bill and I aren't married. His parents mm-hmm. won't allow it. <laughs> When did you get divorced? I didn't long hear about story. that. It's a long story. <laughs> I'd rather not discuss it. <laughs> not on the air. It's too fresh. <laughs> we'll take this one offline. <laughs> I'm legally not allowed to discuss it. <laughs> I'm going to plead the Erica Jane on this one. <laughs> and that's how we believe. Mm-hmm. Will someone please back me the fuck up on this? <laughs> <laughs> and bend my car, car five, five, five times. times. And- yeah, I'm under a lot of stress. Okay, so then one day <laughs> out on the slope, as the burglar hit him, and he my son rolled his car. My son drove over there. It was snowing. He confronted the bur- <laughs> So crazy. And he was unconscious for 12 hours, but nobody knows that. I'm under a lot of stress. <laughs> so then one day out on the slopes, Christina, who was an expert skier, uh, lost control on a very difficult descent. And a man named Jersey Gazicki. Why are there so many jerseys? So many jerseys. <laughs> a lot of jerseys. I mean, they say you fall for your father. And uh, so this guy, true. also named Jersey, how could she resist? Jersey, the situation, Gazicki. <laughs> Can you imagine? (laughs) He came to her rescue and the two immediately hit it off. And she was like, you know, this is great because I can't marry my current boyfriend because his fucking family won't let him. So Mm. I'm a free agent. Later. A free agent. (laughs) Good for her. So Jersey is described by one source as, quote, brilliant, moody, irascible and eccentric. That sounds like. Every not, one of my friends. Not appealing to me. <laughs> I love man, it. No. But 
Uh, he came from a wealthy Polish <laughs> family. Sounds and like a mess. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> fucking annoying. It sounds like he is the drama. But um, I'm not the drama. Am I the drama? <laughs> Am I the, the villain? villain. <laughs> I don't think I'm the villain. So he shared Christina's adventurous spirit. Uh, when he was only 14 years old, after a fight with his father, he had run away from home and traveled to America. <laughs> where he worked as a cowboy and prospected for gold. Amazing. He was Fievel goes He west. was Fievel. <laughs> he was Jersey Fievel. <laughs> Jersey goes west. He went west. <laughs> he then went on to become a writer and a world traveler. So Jesus she's just Christ. like, this is dope. You're wild. You're crazy. I love it. So Christina was smitten. The two married in Warsaw on November 2nd, 1938, and soon moved to Ethiopia. The okay. <laughs> where, Jer- so so random. <laughs> where Jersey had been offered a diplomatic post. In a franchise of Jersey Mike subs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean. Now don't. open in Ethiopia. They don't they- call it Ethiopia for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the airport could use a Jersey Mike's. I'm just saying. So they remained in Ethiopia until Jeez. September of 1939 when Germany fucking invaded Poland. That all, that all happened. That, that happened. So rather than just like staying abroad because it wasn't fucking safe back home for mm-hmm. either of them, like literally she, she wasn't raised in Judaism, but her mm-hmm. mother is Jewish. Yeah. So she definitely counts as Jewish. Right. Yep. Um. You know, whatever. They they could have just stayed abroad and been safe. But mm-hmm. instead, they very bravely uh, sailed immediately for London. And when they arrived, Christina was adamant about finding a way to join the war effort as a spy. Was she the right height? <laughs> she Well, I think she must have been. She was runner-up Miss Poland. True. <laughs> So British authorities at first dismissed her, but thanks to an acquaintance in London who uh, this person was a journalist named Frederick Augustus Voigt, she was able to secure a meeting with the Secret Intelligence Service or the SIS, which is a precursor to MI whatever. Mm -hmm. She presented the SIS with her plan that she had devised. (laughs) And this plan is so amazingly insane. She would ski... Into Nazi-occupied Poland. Perfect. <laughs> I'm, I'm following so far. Like and my glutes are on fire sense. just thinking about <laughs> yeah. it. And uh. deliver British propaganda and also smuggle out any intelligence she could about what the Nazis were doing inside of Poland. Got it. Okay. Fucking on then skis. ski back uphill? Yeah. Got to. Yeah. <laughs> God. Ski in, ski out. Yeah, honey. Fuck. So Britain was in need of more information out of Poland now that the government had fled the country. And Christina, conveniently, because she's also brilliant, spoke Polish, French, and English, Mm -hmm. and also had numerous contacts throughout the country because she grew up very well-to-do in Poland and had all these contacts. Being well-traveled, too, from a young age Mm -hmm. has its benefits. So they decided to take her up on her offer. And they're like, okay, if you fucking want to do this, go for it. It's like no skin off our backs, you know? So... Yeah, this is literally your plan. Yep, right. go ahead. We've tried a lot of other stuff. This so isn't even it. that crazy on that list. Throw some spaghetti at the wall, see if it see sticks. See what sticks. If you yep. run into the Von Traps, tell them which way to go while they're tell them skiing hi. out of there. My Love your outfits. My first thought was the Von Traps. <laughs> <laughs> so, Love your outfits. <laughs> I have curtains if you just see like a that. bunch of kids wearing <laughs> curtains, <laughs> just and keep singing. going. Just pass them. <laughs> So there's a mention Go of the other <laughs> just <laughs> two ships in the night. Just leave them be. So there's a mention of her in the SIS records from around this time in which she is described as a quote flaming Polish patriot, expert <laughs> skier, and great adventuress. Oh my god, I want to be that. I yep. know. And also absolutely fearless. Ah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love her. Mm -hmm. Uh, So most sources simply stop mentioning her fucking husband, Jersey, at this point in the story. So it's unclear whether Fievel 
<laughs> went west. <laughs> went west again or how mm. they parted, but he just kind of drops up out of the picture. He's, He's not the headline here. Mm. No, he maybe he wasn't super into the skiing plan. Um, she would later say of him, quote, he was my Svengali for so many years that he would never believe that I could have ever leave him for good. So I think she was like, bye. Mm-hmm. Mm. So by all accounts, she would go on to have numerous lovers throughout her time working for the British intelligence. And so now she's officially a British secret agent, and she sets off on a journey to Budapest. So Hungary was not yet a participant in World War II. It would go on to be occupied by both the Nazis and the Soviets. It didn't have a great time in the war. Mm-hmm. But at this point, it's not involved yet. And Christina's cover story for being there was that she's a journalist. So from Budapest, she persuaded an acquaintance of hers, a fellow fucking Polish Olympic skier. Yeah. (laughs) Named Jan something to accompany her across the Tatra Mountains into Poland because she didn't want to go it alone. She needed a fellow expert skier. Jesus Christ. So the winter of 1939 does it's fucking, there's war. She's mm-hmm. Jewish. She's a woman. Mm-hmm. She's basically on her own. Mm-hmm. And that winter had record breaking cold temperatures. Yeah, it's oh, rough. Good. It's and a it's, rough one. It's fucking Poland. Like yeah. it gets cold normally. Right. Mm-hmm. But miraculously, the pair survived the journey skiing through these fucking mountains. Do you know how long it took them? I don't know how long it took them. But like back then, all they had was like, Everything's made of wool. Yeah. You yeah. know, you don't have like fucking Gore-Tex. Mm-mm. No. Anything. You're camping every night. Yeah. Right. I can't even imagine. You don't it's, have icy that's a hot. Feat. Yeah. No. Yeah. So upon arriving in Warsaw, Christina went to her mother's home where she pleaded with her Jewish mother to leave Poland. Mm-hmm. But Stefania refused to leave her life in Warsaw behind. She was in denial and... Three years later, her mother would be rounded up in arrests of of Polish Jews and then disappeared into uh, one of Warsaw's prisons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So altogether, Christina, she kept doing her work for British intelligence. She completed four missions into Poland from neutral Hungary. Jesus. Doing this skiing thing. Unbelievable. It's exhausting. She brought intelligence, propaganda, and money to the Polish resistance and smuggled back out intelligence about the Nazis, including radio codes and occasionally microfilm, which she hid inside her gloves. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Badass. On one trip through Hungary, she encountered Andre Kowarski, the horse stable boy. (gasps) Oh, no way. It all circles back. The stable. He was, according to one source, quote, the man who'd become her most significant life companion. Wow. Her Joe Alwyn (laughs) to her Taylor Swift. I don't know who that is. The first one, not the second one. So Kowarski uh, had lost part of his leg in a hunting accident before the war and was now also working to aid the Polish resistance. Mm Mm-hmm. So together, they helped organize a system of Polish couriers to transport intelligence from Warsaw to Budapest. So they got more people. They got a little spiring going. Great. Then at the request of MI6, she and Kowarski began organizing surveillance of all the railroad and river traffic on the borders between Romania and Germany. Dang. Ooh. She's credited with providing vital intelligence to the Allies about oil transports from Germany to Germany from Romania's oil fields. Hmm. She became known for her bravery, especially in the face of potential capture by the Nazis. And so, like, on one fucking particularly harrowing occasion in 1941, so she's been doing this for a while now, Mm -hmm. she and Kowarski were arrested by the Hungarian police and imprisoned and questioned by the Gestapo. Mm -hmm. Our cases are very similar, but no, they're not the same person. Yeah. So in this moment, she bit her tongue until it bled Mm -hmm. and then faked the symptoms of tuberculosis so effectively that the guards feared 
that, that they get it. That they get it, that she yeah. was contagious, and so they let them go. Uh-huh. Oh my God. Uh-huh. Brilliant. Genius. Fucking brilliant. God, that's so cool. But knowing that they would now be closely watched, they realized that they needed to get the fuck out of Hungary, like, you know, the jig was up. Yeah. So the British ambassador in Hungary helped them to escape and obtained false British passports for them with the names Anthony Kennedy and Christine Granville. And so then Christine... Brandy Glanville. Brandy (laughs) Christine Glanville. Oh, my God. Don't make her a spy. (laughs) Actually, she did bring down some people, so maybe do. Um... (laughs) But Christina would then use the name Christine Granville well in the UK for the rest of her life. Um, A British embassy officer then smuggled Christina into Yugoslavia in the trunk of his car while Kowarski drove himself across the border. And the British ambassador met up with them soon after in Serbia, where the group, quote, enjoyed a few days of drinking champagne in Belgrade's nightclubs and belly dancing bars. <laughs> Gotta find time for fun. Yes. Gotta find time for yeah, fun. Yeah, they fucking More time earned is serious. It. They did fucking earn it. <laughs> mm-hmm. What a fucking life. Yep. This woman is leading. God. I mean, Go for real. all the way. Go I just og. fucking drink tea and... Take Dayquil and watch Acorn TV. And hope your back holds out. Yeah. Huh. But you're doing what you love. That's mm-hmm. true. And you're not living through a world war yet, so it's That's fine. That's true. That's mm-hmm. true. Count your blessings. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Christina and Kowarski continued on to Bulgaria, where they met with British intelligence and passed along some rolls of microfilm that they had been given by a Polish resistance group that was called the Musketeers. Love. Oh. <laughs> And to the shock of British authorities, the microfilm contained photos of a Nazi military buildup near the border with the Soviet Union, which Drag indi- em. which indicated that an invasion was being planned, which mm-hmm. broke up the fucking Nazi Soviet pact and fucking changed the war forever because then the Nazis were fucking stupidly fighting on two fronts. And that is what actually led to them losing. Thank God. Mm-hmm. Wow. So... The photos were sent to Winston Churchill, who would eventually call Christina his, quote, favorite spy. (laughs) And they turned out to be accurate. And so a few months later, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Like, that is such a... She fucking broke that story Mm -hmm. that the Nazis were going to invade the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. This woman. The turning point of the war. How nuts is that? That's so cool. So Christina was then sent to work uh, in Egypt in the Middle East. I think it's, we don't talk about it as much, but like World War II absolutely went into like North Africa and mm-hmm. the middle, like it was everywhere. Where she studied Morse code, parachuting, weaponry, uh, yep. methods of assassination. Oh, we'll get to it. Oh. And then she was sent back behind enemy lines into France in the summer of 1944. So she fucking worked through the entire mm-hmm. Second World War as mm-hmm. a spy. Here she worked under a man who would become another one of her lovers, Special Operations Executive Agent Francis Kamertz. She assisted him in coordinating supplies and training for the training the French resistance in the lead up to D Day. Mm-hmm. Another story of her bravery in the face of capture: she reportedly saved his life after he was arrested in the days before D Day. She walked around the prison where she believed he was being held, singing a favorite song of his until mm-hmm. she heard him singing it back. Oh my, my god. god. And that's how she knew he was in there. And mm-hmm. then she entered the prison and told the guards that she was related to a senior British diplomat mm-hmm. and somehow was able to persuade them that, you know. She rolled really high on her perception yeah, check. Yeah, exactly. To just, <laughs> she just like freaked them out enough and was like, do you fucking know who I am? Yeah. My oh. father will hear about this. My God. Um, she malfoyed her way in there. Yeah. God bless She's her. She's incredible. Yeah. And they fucking let him go. hmm Amazing. So there are numerous other stories about her avoiding capture, saving others from like certain death or execution. Like she's just fucking amazing. Mm-hmm. She would later claim that she had been, quote, unaware of any danger to herself in those moments. <laughs> oh. What? 
Ugh. like it's Ugh. hard. Like it's hard. <laughs> I love her. <laughs> I love her so much, but then this next part gets really sad. So, oh. tragically, despite all she had done, Christina Scarbeck, or Christine Granville, was essentially abandoned by the British government after the war. Mm-hmm. No. So the SIS dismissed her with only a month's salary, like no fucking pension. Mm. She and- saved the yep. world? Uh-huh. Yeah. And left her to just fend for herself. So then Mm -hmm. she had to apply for an authentic British passport because the one she had was fake because she was a spy for this country. Yeah. Oh, my God. That'll happen. So the process was endlessly delayed by bureaucracy. She couldn't even fucking get a real British passport. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. She eventually made her way to Kenya, where she met up with an old lover and attempted to find a job, but the British colonial government turned down her fucking work permit. Oh, for God's sakes. You have nothing to offer, so. God. And, like, none of her accomplishments were probably, like, on paper. No, you can't can't talk about it. I mean, literally, there's, like, a total gag order. You can't talk about any of the work that you did Mm -hmm. during the war. That's fucked. She signed the, uh, I'm sure that she'd signed the Official Secrets Act. Mm Mm-hmm. So she returned to London. She worked like odd fucking jobs. She had to become a cabin steward on an ocean liner. Mm-hmm. Ick. She was literally banished onto a cruise for yeah. the remainder of her days. Ugh, I'm so sorry. She had a hard time making friends amongst the British crew who disliked her for being a foreigner. Okay. Oh, my God. And accused her of lying about her wartime exploits. Whatever. Whatever, dude. God. And it was at this job that she met and briefly had an affair with a co-worker named Dennis Muldowney, the fucking worst dude ever. Mm. But soon she broke it off, stating that he was, quote, obstinate and terrifying, mm. a.k.a. abusive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then tragically, on June 15th, 1952, Christina was stabbed to death in the Shelburne Hotel in London, and her attacker was this fucking... Yahoo, Dennis Ugh. Muldowney. Oh god my damn god! Who was just pissed about her that breaking she broke up, up with him? Mm-hmm. Yep, son of a bitch. And he god. was arrested for murder and hanged. Thank goodness. But yeah, that can you fucking believe that that is that that's what took her down in the yeah. end? It's just so it's, senseless and sad. That, Ugh. Fucking patriarchy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fucking patriarchy. Mm-hmm. So following her death, a group of men who had known her, including Andre, the horse stables guy, uh, organized to stop the publication of several news stories and two books about her that would have focused on salacious details about her sex Mm -hmm. life. Uh, Rather than her stunning uh, accomplishments. Right, exactly. And brilliance. Mm -hmm. So author Madeleine Masson uh, later wrote that, quote, 12 men who all loved Christine banded together to make sure that no one wrote rubbish about her. Mm -hmm. So Kowarski, uh, Andre, passed away in Munich in 1988, and one of his last wishes was to have his ashes interred beside Christina's, although he acknowledged that her one true love was Poland. Oh. oh, I got chills. So he loved her, but he knew that he came second to Poland. Yeah. That's so cute. Nobody can ever beat out Poland. Oh, Don't no. even try. You won't win. In 1971, <laughs> after the Shelbourne Hotel changed owners, a trunk was found. That's where she was shot mm-hmm. and killed by that fucker. Mm-hmm. Um. A trunk was found in a storeroom that contained her clothes, papers, and an SOE issue dagger. Mm-hmm. <gasps> Ooh. The dagger, her service medals, and some of her papers are now held in the Polish Museum in London. A legitimate biography of Christina was eventually written by a, an author named Claire Mully, who summed her subject up thusly quote, She loved men and sex, adrenaline and adventure, her <laughs> family and her country. She loved life and the freedom to live it to the full. God damn since, right. Since childhood, her most defining characteristic has been an intense desire for freedom, 
freedom from authority to roam and ride and live, jobs, marriages, and the polite rules of society were unacceptable constraints. God ah, love and bless. I love her. I know. Oh my God, she's amazing. I have chills. I so know. Good. I love her. I love her. Yeah. Well, we, our, our ladies are, they are sisters. Great. Yes. It's I uh, you have yeah it's stories of badassery are just the most fun. Well, I sure hope you liked that clip. If you did like that clip, make sure you are subscribing to our YouTube channel, leaving us a nice review, and joining us on Patreon for even more video content, audio content, salacious content all around. Come join us. Treat yourself. <laughs>